I thought I could talk to you about the power of open resources to break down barriers to learners, to meet their learning needs and preferences rather than expecting them to fit into a one size fits all education. But I decided not to do that. If you'd like to learn more about that, let me know and I'll share some slides, um, some links to previous talks and also some resources that help you on that quest. I decided to dig in to a different topic today. So if you'll humor me, turns out we're in the middle of a revolution. I know you might say, but I just had a tuna fish sandwich for lunch yesterday. That doesn't feel like something you'd do in the middle of a revolution. Nonetheless, here we are. You may say, look, I'm not senior enough to have an impact, or I have power, but I'm not sure how to rock the boat in a responsible and professional way. One of the questions earlier reminds me of this, right? When we start to look at systems and expectations and the way we've always done things and we start to disentangle all of that, it can be really messy. So I want to speak to both people. I want to speak to the people who have the power and the people who don't have the power. If you have the power, I want to ask you as a leader, are you doing work to help those behind you not only take over where you left off, but to surpass you, progress beyond where you've been? Are you comfortable with them passing you? Are your goals built around this as an expected outcome, an inevitability, a must have? What, were, what will your legacy be? If you are not in a position of power, leadership, I would argue, is even harder for you. That's right, I'm saying that people who are in positions of power have it easier in terms of leadership. Um, when you don't have power, showing leadership means stick, sticking your neck out, standing up, standing out, stepping up. And there are plenty of times and plenty of environments where that isn't valued and it's act, or it's actively punished. Seeing something that isn't working and fixing it, seeing someone that's struggling and helping them and doing it, not because it's part of your job description, but because it's the right thing to do. When I hear folks talk about this kind of leadership, they're usually worried um, that what they did is going to upset someone and that they'll lose their job or they'll get in trouble or they'll get sued. Um, so what does this have to do? Sorry, sorry. Uh, what does this have to do with open, you might ask? Well, open, I would argue, is our revolution. We're engaged in a battle to make information, the quest for knowledge, and all the many benefits from both available to anyone. And in this quest, we're taking a holistic approach. Lillian did an awesome job of giving us some of this context. So uh, you've got David Wiley and the five R's, right? Some people say that's not enough. That just speaks to content. And open is much more than that. You've got Lisa Petridis, Doug Levin, Edward Watson talking about something called the CARE framework. Can, I'll make links available to all of this. Where you contribute, where you attribute, where you release, and where you empower. That is, you're not just taking from the commons, but you're contributing to it as well. So what does it mean to feed a commons? And what does it mean to take food from a commons? And how many of you are furiously trying to remember Kant and J.S. Mill right now? <laughs> These are all the spaces and places where this revolution is focusing uh, um, effort. So OER, open access publishing, open textbooks, open science, open pedagogy, and then I made up some of these things. Open <laughs> assessments. Um, we talk about open assessments, right? Open dialogue. Um, I spoke about that. How many of you were at Open Ed in Niagara this past fall? Okay. So you've heard a bit of this um, about open dialogue and then opening minds. And so when you scratch the surface of this work, you get to this, um, the social justice issues that it aims to address. I spoke to some of this in that keynote um, and um, I'll make a, a link available to that as well. So uh, Lillian talked about the food or books, right? Uh, the who creates knowledge, who has access to knowledge, who gets the learning opportunities, and who has a voice. Those are all social justice issues, I would argue, and we can point to places where we're failing in all of these. Many others speak about this in their work too. At OpenCon last year, Leslie Chan, who's a professor at the University of Toronto, 
and others spoke on a panel about inclusion, he mentioned a term that a colleague of his uses to reference the killing off of ways of knowing rather than embracing diversity. His colleague called it epistemicide, which I think is a really cool word. Um, and here, Leslie says, when we think about open science, we have to be careful about whether we're thinking of a monolithic concept. There should be many open sciences. Excluding other ways of knowing is to our detriment. Now, um, some of us are comfortable with that, some of us aren't. So I want to dig into that for a second. This is just yesterday, Dr. Melissa Terrace was quoted in a lecture she gave at the Turing Institute where she said, all data is historical data, the product of a time, place, political, economic, technical, and social climate. If you're not considering why your data exists and other data sets don't, you are doing data science wrong. Bold move. Just this statement. Some of us take for granted, others of us disagree with. It makes some of us very uncomfortable, but we're not having a conversation about this and we need to. So Melissa Terrace, is the professor of digital cultural heritage at the University of Edinburgh's College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, and she is a Turing Institute fellow. I don't know her. I don't know her institution. I don't know the Turing Institute. I stumbled upon this yesterday. And then something interesting happened. This happened. Um, careful about relativism, we're warned. Don't open this up too far. We still need rigor. We need academic quality. We still need a mechanism for determining who's best. So this is a researcher, and we'll get into who he is in a moment. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm not convinced that single molecules care much about the political climate, was his response to her original tweet. And then she said, no, but data about molecules is a product of value propositions regarding funding and the deployment of resources and what is worthy of study and also history of scientific development, which is the wider point I'm making, not looking at what was sampled. And then he said, beware of relativism, little smiley face. And she didn't respond as of, as of right now. <laughs> she still hasn't responded. Now, most people would look at this and would say, stop. I'm not going to respond. And I th I, I'm speculating, but most of us would stay the hell away from this, right? But I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't because I was coming here today, and I wanted to talk to you about when it's time to speak up. And I'm really struggling with this because I have a hard time speaking up. I have a hard time standing up. I have a hard time with this revolution thing and figuring out how to be a part of it and do it in a way that makes me vulnerable but doesn't leave me open to being eviscerated. And those are fine lines. So I wanted to say it's not relativism. We can differentiate between law and supposition. I thought a lot about my response. We're capable about being transparent about the path of capital in our work. Who paid for it? Thank you, eCampus Ontario. Whether we have a conflict of interest we can be honest about our biases, I think, if it's influencing our data collection. If it's possible, there's another yet undiscovered explanation for what we're seeing. Why can't we be excited about that too? So I wondered, what is the fondness for correctness or completion? What if we leave things incomplete and wonder? So I stepped into the dangerous territory and I said the following. Um, what did I say? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't put it all here. Hold on a second. This isn't the full thread. Sorry. I said in response to, oh, uh, I screwed this up. Stand by, I know you're dying to know what I said. <laughs> so I stepped into the dangerous territory after the beware of relativism smiley face, and I said, Contextualizing need not lead to relativism. Rather, it's acknowledging the role of capital, context, and complex systems that make up our world. And then he responded, and he said, how do you suggest that I contextualize this? And if you click on the link, you get to a paper that he wrote that's really, really complicated science stuff. And I said, 
by using good scientific practices, for example, disclosing conflicts of interest, using careful language as you do in the abstract, use the, the phrase may provide and likelihood, that leave open yet undiscovered explanations. I believe in even a layperson's ability to differentiate between law, gravity, and supposition. And then I woke up this morning because he's in Britain and it said, I think you may be confusing the everyday use of likelihood with its precise statistical meaning. So uh, to the statisticians, I'm sure I am screwing something up. And so I, I, I wanna learn. I want him to explain to me, but I also maintain that I think there is probably this continuum of, I think this is the case and we know this is a law. Gravity, for instance, we don't screw around with, right? But then this guy has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> he's actually, um, he's really, he's, he's way more sophisticated in terms of statistics than I am. I've never had a statistics course. So I really took a risk in stretching my neck out there. Right? But I wondered. There's no question. Science should stick to those things it knows, and good science should continue to not know. So there's this wonderful article that they found that foxes strongly prefer to jump in a northeasterly direction, around 20 degrees off of magnetic north. This fixed heading was important for their success as hunters. They're more likely to make a kill if they jumped along this preferred axis. If they jumped, um, particularly if their prey was hidden in high cover or snow, if they pounced to the northeast, they killed 73% of their attacks. If they jumped in the opposite direction, the success rate plummeted to 60%. In all other directions, only 18% of their pounces were successful. So what's nice about this article is then it quotes two scientists who say, John Phillips says, uh, who studies magnetic senses at Virginia Tech says, the challenge and the fun for anyone interested is to come up with another explanation that can explain the data. The strength of the author's conclusions are only as good as the inability of anyone else to come up with an alternative hypothesis. That's science, right? Prove the null, not prove the supposition. Roswitha uh, Wilsko, one of the pioneers who deciphered the magnetic sense of birds, says in the same article, the findings are really astonishing. But she also thinks that they're speculative. This explanation has plausibility only because there's hardly any other mechanism that indicates directions. The problem is you can't turn off magnetic north and do a study with foxes. We can't eliminate it to see if the foxes still exhibit this behavior. Can't we be really, really excited about that? Isn't that cool? I think so. So good science is good. It asks the questions and it does this work of discovery and innovation by failing, by being interested in failure, by questioning through a curiosity. Like, could you come up with any other explanation for this? Could anything else be creating this phenomenon? By speculating and then trying to disprove it. That's what I learned science was doing. Some of us are eager to revolutionize. Um, some of us who are eager to revolutionize are remaining critical and questioning assumptions we've all made, just like good science does. So some of us are questioning, who's a producer? Is it just instructors? And we say, no, it's students as well. So students create question banks. This tears down the notion that assessment is something that needs to happen by an objective instructor, right? Students can create assessments. Then it also challenges whose intellectual property are we concerned with? We spend a lot of time focusing on the researchers. What about cases where, for example, we've heard indigenous stories that are collected by a really well-meaning PhD student who's desperate to get their thesis published and then that story becomes the property of a museum or an archive or a repository. And now the person whose story it is doesn't have access to that story. We have lots of cases of that. So support and sharing, not many of us experienced either of those in undergraduate or graduate schools. It was competition, protecting information and publishing before someone else scooped you. 
So we're all capable of open, and there isn't an industry or discipline that wouldn't benefit from open. And these are just some examples that it's not just text. It's music, it's art, it's images, it's photos, it's thoughts, it's ideas, it's videos, it's everything. And this is kind of exciting. This was just announced last week. And this, I don't know, Lillian, you might be interested in this for your quest for Francophone Ontarians. The Mozilla crowdsourced the largest data set of human voices available for use, including 18 different languages, adding up to almost 1,400 hours of recorded voice data from more than 42,000 contributors. As a community-driven project, people around the world who care about having a voice database in their language have been responsible for every new launch. Some are passionate volunteers, some are doing this as part of their day jobs as linguists or technologists. Each of these efforts require translating the website to allow contributions and adding sentences to be read. This is huge. This is going to change everything. As we automate, as we go to machine learning, as we go to artificial intelligence, as we go from text to speech, these are the, this is going to allow us to do it in 18 different languages. Some of these languages don't exist on the internet yet. This is tearing the handle off the pump, which when I say that, I'm afraid people don't get it anymore because Jon Snow has become this character in Game of Thrones. <laughs> but Jon Snow, the grandfather of epidemiology, saw the correlation, right? well, the causation actually, of the data of where people in London were getting sick from cholera and it was coming from the public pump. So he, he didn't form a committee. He didn't wait for funding. He tore the handle off the pump. All right. So, so we just did a bit of the who and the what. Do you see yourselves in this slide? Are people in this room responsible for any of these things? Do you do some of them? Does anybody not do any of them? Okay. And this, do you see where you can provide leadership in this slide? Where you can have an impact? We may say we aren't political, we aren't an activist, and those things can all be true. What is also true is that nothing we do or say is neutral. It's embedded in our experiences, as Lillian showed us, and our context. We make choices, and I'll call them design choices, all the time. So nothing is neutral. We're all designers, and we're all part of this revolution by virtue of being designers, or else we're not. We're part of the status quo and the perpetuating of the way we do things. Cataloging is not a neutral act. There were a lot of you in this room who were librarians. Taxonomies, it's not just a neutral means of organizing knowledge, but inevitably serves as a means to establish and naturalize hierarchic structures. We experience this when we create our own taxonomies. If you're in downtown Toronto and it's night and you see a little animal scurrying along and it has a hump in its back, what is it? It's not a trick question. <laughs> it's a raccoon, right? It's a raccoon. It's a city of raccoons. Mm -hmm. Except there were a couple of capybaras that got loose in High Park a couple of years ago, right? So it could have been a capybara. So we have this quick brain, slow brain, right? This is Daniel uh, Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. Do you create a new entry in your database or is it the raccoon? Whenever we create buckets of something, you get something that doesn't quite fit. So then you wind up creating, oh, 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 it just means I need to create another bucket. I forgot about this differentiation between this thing and this thing. But how many of you, when you've packed to move, find a miscellaneous bucket where it's one of these, you just sort of grab everything and stick it in there? Publishing is not neutral. Paywalls create haves and have-nots. Where is the capital? Who stands to benefit? Who's left out or left behind? Who does not have access? In some cases, access to their own stories. This from Spark and from Nicole Allen, textbooks are not neutral. We see the textbook cost increase versus, the increase, uh, versus inflation, and we see how astronomical that is. Syllabi are not neutral. We say to students that we want them to be creative, and then we give them a syllabus that lays out exactly what we want them to do, exactly what we want to see from them. Follow the path. Don't deviate. 
We should be creating only as much structure as is absolutely needed and nothing more. We need to design the syllabus so anyone can walk through it and inject it with creativity and curiosity and questioning and failure and speculation. So often we start our negotiation of form and function in a classroom with this. And this lays out exactly what you need to do to get an A. Follow the path. Don't deviate. Don't smell the flowers. Classrooms are not neutral. We need to create teaching and learning environments that are focused on the goals and the notions of success of the learners. Who does this layout benefit? Who doesn't benefit from this? Who gets left behind? We know reality is messy. You're not supposed to be able to read what's on this slide. Um, we know it's wonderfully complex. We know it's intersectional. We know it's yet to be discovered. But what do we do with it? We take all of that messiness and that richness and we inflict formality by co codifying structure around creativity. We flatten it. We formalize it. We seek to validate it. This is actually the content that was on the previous page. But we've come to tear. We put shiny shoes on it. And we send it out to make a good impression. It's not neutral when we do this. We should ask ourselves, what gets lost? What's the byproduct? or the sawdust or the waste that's created by our need to have neat, simple, exact corners. And while we're at it, since we can now see this is a social justice issue, let us ask what is justice? Who determines this? Some will go back to that relativism point, but I don't think we need to. I think that we can appeal to the UN and we can say justice is inclusion an equitable quality education and the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities for all. And do it by 2030, by the way. That's overwhelming. Some will say it's too much for me to take on. Some will scoff, laugh this off as unattainable. Others will call it aspirational, but will work to find ways to move in that direction. So who's going to take this on? Are you working toward this? I'll tell you rule number one is don't panic. So context matters. The context here, I'm going to read this to you so you don't have to try to read it. Um, the context here was that Nicole Allen from Spark and I had dinner together in Sydney. It was a random, we happened to be in Australia at the same time. And we wanted to address what it means to be a responsible leader in open. And we wanted to make it clear that it's not relativism, that anything does not go. We can't, why can't we do this kind of sliding scale of responsibility? Do as much as you possibly can and more, especially if you have the resources to do it. So we said, the meaning of open is clear and aspirational. In practice, openness must be understood in context. Large actors have more resources, more power, and therefore more responsibility. Small actors often are not structurally empowered to be radically open, but can still make meaningful steps. That's the don't panic. You can still make meaningful steps. Open is a process, and we should focus on how open things are and for whom, rather than just whether something is open or not. So inclusive and equitable by 2030, that's justice. So let's get into the details of that. What's the least we can do to achieve justice? Let's remember this, shall we? Which kids are the bad kids? Who decides based on what rules and who made the rules? This says, I wish my teacher knew how smart some of the bad kids are. A little kid wrote this when their uh, teacher asked them to write something down on a post-it that they wish that he or she knew. I was going to say something else, but I just forgot it. Oh, I was going to say about the bad kids. How many teachers out there actually really like the bad kids? OK. <laughs> Maybe just in K through 12. <laughs> so I want to talk about what it means to stand up. Uh, remember earlier, if you aren't in a position of power, leadership becomes even harder. Because showing leadership when you aren't in a position of power means sticking your neck out, standing up, stepping out, standing um, out. And there are plenty of times and environments 
where that isn't valued or it's actively punished. Seeing something isn't working, helping someone, doing it because it's the right thing to do despite the consequences. We have some examples of pretty radical revolutionaries who risked everything to be open. Aaron Swartz, Basil Cartabil, these two gave their lives for open. Um, Aaron was arrested at MIT in 2011. He's the kid who um, downloaded all of JSTOR and then made it publicly available. No paywall, information should be free. It was a cute little prank, and it was a very principled prank. It was more than that. He, he felt very passionately that this was what needed to be happen. The Department of Justice came down on him. Um, they wanted to, they uh, charged him with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of computer fraud and abuse, carrying a cumulative maximum penalty of a million dollars in fines, 35 years in prison, asset forfeiture, restitution, and supervised release. He declined a plea bargain under which he would have served six months in a federal prison. Two days after the prosecution rejected a counteroffer by him, he hung himself. Basil Safadi was a Palestinian um, Syrian open source software developer who was executed by the Syrian regime shortly after his disappearance in 2015. This was a year after um, Arab Spring. He was in Damascus. He was part of the Creative Commons community and making software available to everyone. Then we've got the people who never got justice. We've got Emmett Till. In uh, 1955, this young African-American was lynched in Mississippi at the age of 14 after being accused of offending a white woman in her family's grocery store. He uh, was accused of whistling at her. The brutality of his murder and the fact that his killers were acquitted drew attention um, to the long history of violent persecution of African-Americans. Now we've got this poster. 20 unarmed men, women, and children of color killed by law enforcement since 2012. This speaks to our context. Then we've got those who suffered injustices. Malala, she's known for her human rights advocacy, right? Especially the education of women and children in her native um, uh, nor uh, town in Northwest Pakistan, where the local Taliban had at times banned girls from attending school. Uh, she was shot on a bus. She lived, she's a Nobel Prize winner. And then people who still haven't gotten justice. The Trail of Tears, uh, sorry, Highway of Tears, series of murders and disappearances of more than 40 young girls, indigenous women, along Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert, British Columbia, since 1970. Sometimes standing up means losing your job. So many of us fear this. How many times have you done something you felt was risky on a Friday afternoon and been convinced that by Monday you'd be fired? Kneeling during the Star Spangled Banner is what Colin Kaepernick did. During a post-game interview, he explained his position saying, I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. So you see, when I decided to respond to a senior researcher who's an expert in statistics, a scientist who has a lot of degrees and it works at a very fancy institution, I, I decided to stand up and it felt risky, but these people have taken enormous risks. When do we say enough is enough? When do we stand up? What's interesting about this to me is that we can't define it but we know it when it's the moment, don't we? You can't speculate and say, a couple of weeks from now is the time I'm gonna stand up. But when the fever pitch gets high enough, then you stand up. Standing up is really hard. There's a young uh, woman in Africa who says that she isn't rich enough to stand up yet or to speak out. She works in our community in open education. Her voice isn't heard by any of us. She said she isn't rich enough to stand up or speak out so we don't hear her voice. It's not enough to just make it open. We have to break down some of the barriers to hearing those voices. Um, I was just in Savannah a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, the superintendent of schools there talked about how she's at a point in her career where she could just 
call in from lunch that she's not coming back. <laughs> she, and she feels this sort of, um, she feels free in making changes to a system that she knows is not working for kids because she's at a point in her career where she's so senior, she can just do that call in from lunch and say, I'm done. How do we, how do we grant that to the young researchers, to somebody new in their career in Africa who wants to talk about OER? So other examples of when standing up means taking enormous risks, Edward Snowden, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, so then it, it challenges me to contend with this, I, I don't know, when do you stand up? I'm uncomfortable with standing up. When do you stand up and say enough is enough? This week, or last week, Elsevier, um, at the University of California system stood up and said enough is enough. They said no more to Elsevier. They were <laughs> unwilling to meet the UC's key goals securing universal open access to UC research, as stated in the UC's faculty-driven principles on scholarly communication. They put a community together, a committee, they wrote some principles down, and then they stuck to them. And they finally stood up and said enough is enough. This is a big deal. They represent 10% of all US published research output. Stephen Hawking says, anyone, anywhere in the world should have free, unhindered access to not just my research, but to the research of every great and inquiring mind across the spectrum of human understanding. He also says, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. So back to that science, right? Is there any other explanation? Why can't we be excited about wondering about that? What is our fascination or our obsession with completion? This is our revolution, folks. Kathy Davidson in our community quoting James Baldwin, hat, hat tweeting it to Audrey Waters, who said, it's, it is your responsibility to change society if you think of yourself as an educated person, James Baldwin. And now this, this is the last slide. So this image was created by art student Alex Bertulis Fernandez, and she produced it in response to a professor of hers suggesting that she dial down the feminism. <laughs> that didn't work out so well because it went viral. Uh, it's now, she now sells it as a sticker, a poster, I think there's a t-shirt, and at least 10% of all of her earnings go to charities. So on one side it says, um, complicit in my own dehumanization, on the other side of the, of the dial is the raging feminist. I put myself over there. Where are you gonna put yourself? It's time to choose. 